Thomas, you're very welcome to episode 10 of Scaling Your Business podcast. Thank you very much for having me on, Ryan. It is a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, I'm delighted to have you here because most of the guests, when you Google them, there are one or two pictures come up, but you have some presence online. <laughs> Uh, some would argue too many pictures yeah i'm making content since i was like 12 so um there's like a pretty deep catalog of stuff on the internet so uh and i love making content so yeah well there's a couple of things that we i feel like we both believe in so i'm really excited for this conversation because it's a lot of what i've been trying to initially trying to ram down the throats of the older generation and less so doing that and more so just doing it myself and eventually they'll cop on or not um, but we, we've got a number of mutual connections from doing research. I know that you know Jamie White. I know that you know Alex Palmadilla uh, and a couple of others as well. So, um, And from having chatted to a few of them over the phone over the last couple of days, no one has a bad word to say about you. So although you have a good presence, it, 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 it's good. Or a big presence is good. So look, a couple of things I want to jump into today. I want to hand the microphone to you to give an introduction because... You've started out what I can only assume was B2B door or sorry, uh, uh, door to door sales and phone watch. You mm -hmm. did an internship at Microsoft. Uh, you've gone viral for a couple of your videos about is college worth the investment or not? We can jump into that. And uh, then most recently you started a, what I can only describe as an influencer house. So rather than me give your entire CV, why don't you take the microphone for 30 seconds and tell everyone who you are? Yeah, cool. That was a nice tee off. Uh, yeah, so Thomas Arnold, 23, as you said, uh, I've done a couple of different businesses so far. Basically, the first one I started when I was 18 was a video production business. So that's called Fearless Media. That's sort of almost finished up now, but uh, I still do a little bit of it at the side. And that's just pure video production. So that's brands getting videos out on social, websites, stuff like that. And then the other business I started last year in September was a thing called The Go House. So it's Ireland's first TikTok house. And that's the two main businesses I've been running with. But other than that, uh, I've always had a competitive streak in me. So I always used to love sports. And now I guess I just really like business. And I'm just very hungry to build something of meaning and sort of uh, not be an inspiration for other people, but like, try and lead by example as best I can. So um, yeah, I'm on the journey to do that. What is it that lights that fuel underneath your ass? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think I'm just like never really happy with anything. I put it that way. I'm never really satisfied with anything. So that sort of is definitely what drives me. Now, look, I'm not necessarily the hardest working person in the world, nor am I the most successful or anything like that. But I do have this weird, like just want to always do more and even that goes so far back as when I was nine. I remember I used to do like extra maths homework after school. So I was always ahead of my classmates in primary school. Wow. And I used to cry when I used to lose matches or like when I'd lose maths tests and stuff like that. So um, I just, I'm like, I really have a hunger to want to do more and be more. So that's it really, I think. That's deadly. Well, one of the things I've noticed um, having the pleasure to be in the room with many high achievers is that those all have a number of things in common. One of them being they journal. They write down, as well as journal, they write down the list of things they want to get done the next day, the night before, or the morning of. So they know that they just got to tackle that list. And if they can get through that list, it's a successful day or the number of the main items on the list. When researching you, you did a video on your biggest lessons learned from 2020. You listed three things. Can you talk me through why you chose those three? Move faster, dream big, and you've got no idea what it is on the other side of what someone says to you. Yeah, it's funny when you put together those lists because it's like you're trying to summarize life into very small bite-sized chunks, but that's not how life is. You know yourself, like you wake up every day and it's different and stuff. Um, but if I was to sort of summarize those three things, I guess – Move Fast. I have a podcast with my co-founder, Jake, called Move Fast and Break Things. And that was stolen from Mark Zuckerberg. And Zuckerberg says that, basically, he says that if you're not moving fast enough in business and you're not breaking things, sorry, he says, if you're not breaking things and moving fast, then you're not moving fast enough, is what he says. And move fast to me just means, am I spending time on things that could be done a lot quicker? Am I like wasting times on things that aren't important? That's sort of what I mean with that, because I think you can get a lot more done than you think. Um, dream big is is basically I know it's pretty corny when people tell you to write down your goals and stuff but 
I'm a definitely a believer in I privately write down what goals I have and I don't necessarily share them with anybody else. But it's important, even if they seem cringy on the page, that they are written down. Even if mm-hmm. I end up going way left and I don't end up doing what's written down there, it's good to get it out of my head and onto paper or digitally. And there's a thing that I think Peterson started, Jordan B. Peterson, called the Future Self-Authoring Program or the Future Authoring Program, where you just lay out your next three to five years and I've done that exercise before and like, it's helpful. I may not necessarily do all the things I said I did, but it's good to write it down. And then the last thing is, yeah, like I think it's good to be regimented and like do things a certain way and to get your work done. But then I also think you need a degree of serendipity where you allow yourself to say yes to things you wouldn't necessarily say yes to, um, to just experience things because there are always things to learn from people no matter who they are be they yeah. high or low or whoever, you can always learn if you're willing to listen. So um, that's what I think with those three. I love all three of them. All three of them resonated somewhat with me picking on the last one. Um, I got a call oh, maybe two and a half years ago on my phone, didn't answer it, got a call again a couple of minutes later and someone said they wanted me to speak at a conference in Dublin. Nine times out of 10, when someone rings me or emails me to speak at a conference, they want me to sponsor the conference. And as a result, I get a speaking slot. And I'm not interested in that most of the time. So I thought this was another one of those. So I just pushed them off and said, email me and I'll take a look at it. And I thought I'd never take a look at it. Fast forward a couple of weeks later, it was a legit thing. And I spoke at Crow Park at a, at a conference. And I that goes back to your thing of you have no idea what is on the other side of what something says. And as a result of speaking on that, it then created a partnership, which then landed a deal. And now it landed a a corporate client that pays well money so again all those small things can lead to to bigger and greater things so firm believer in that your dream big uh mentioned peterson big fan of peterson's work uh and i also have vision boards as well and i believe that once you've got a process in place things become a lot easier and a plan you can work backwards to understand what you need to achieve by a certain date and time anyway i digress one of your uh more viral videos is around college and the importance or unimportance if that's even a word of it i loved your argument for it but rather than me tell it why don't you tell it do you think college is important you mentioned one of the things that it helps with dealing with people but i'll let you speak more to that yeah i think yeah college obviously is just a a way of framing education and Mm that was like the traditional form of education where you go to a lecture and there's a lecturer there and they teach you about something and you do assignments and stuff like that. That was like way more important say 30 years ago when my parents were growing up where there was a, there was like a legit scarcity of people who had a college education and those who had it probably did know more than people who didn't have a college education. And therefore they were probably more valuable like in the workplace and therefore you should hire them. And then when the internet started and people now can access information on their fingertips, well, all the information became commoditized. It's all a commodity now. So like you can find it anywhere. It can be in books. It can be on Google. There's no like, you can't hide. No more excuses anymore. Yeah. 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 Like the quality of the information is about the same. Like I'd argue you could probably research stuff better than what people can just present to you in a textbook and the stuff in textbooks, they're like released over a series of years. They might be five, six, seven years old particularly if you're to look at the social media scene stuff changes like every single year you'd actually almost need to be writing new books every month to to keep on track so the reason i go into that spiel about college is that college's relevance is not the same as it once was so if you want to go to college i think you need to reassess well what do you want to get out of it so if i'm going to in ireland anyway we only put in three grand a year so that's not a huge amount of money yeah if i'm if we're putting in three grand well how can i extract three grand or more back and for me i felt like now this has obviously changed with covid but you can learn interpersonal skills through like projects and societies and stuff you can it can help grow your relationships the old adage of like you have good friends from college that is like true if you go to a decent sized one where you can actually make friends and and the other main thing is that it gives you a lot of creative license to like do whatever you want because when you're in college nobody expects anything of you you can do what you want like your business could be like a failure but like nobody's going to care because they assume you're building yourself up to get a job so that's the benefit of it downside to it is that 
obviously there's opportunity cost there where you could use that say it's a three-year course you could use that nine grand to go start your own business and you'd probably learn a lot more than you would in your course and um, there's also the time where like i it's hard for me to judge this because i'm only 23 but i feel like your energy is highly skewed toward the first towards the first part of your life so like i won't have the same energy now as i will have at 50 so i'm trying to like front load all my work when i'm a bit younger and do crazy stuff because i can now like i've got no responsibilities and I'm like, I feel a lot of energy. So potentially if you're 18 and you go off and start something and like really jump in, it could, you could learn a lot in those three years that you couldn't get in college. But there's the societal thing as well around like my friends are going, I want to go. And um, it can be a difficult choice for people. So I think the main thing is that go into college consciously, understand what you're trying to get out of it and conduct yourself in that way. Go in and say to yourself, this is what I'm here for, as opposed to just like rolling in like a fucking snowflake and you don't know Agreed. what you're doing. Agreed. One of the things that you picked up on was knowing what you're going in for because connections in college can, can like, that's why a lot of the larger colleges can charge such a massive fee because th there's more and bigger doors that can be opened for you. But again, know what you're going in for. A friend recently said to me, Rian, I want to start a marketing agency. So I'm going to go to DMI to do a three-year course so we can learn about digital marketing. And I said, mate, you'll be outdated within three weeks of being on that course, if that's your only goal. If you want to go in to make connections, yeah, go in with that. But have a number of reasons why you want to go in rather than just learn the curriculum because it's outdated before it started. Like people come out with digital marketing books and I, I almost laugh if their sole reason is trying to sell it to make money because one, that's incredibly difficult, but two, the book's are dated by the time it's already gone to print. If you're using it as a, like a business card to get on podcasts and different shows, that's a good excuse, but most books are outdated if, if, in that realm. After college, I'm assuming you did the time of college then work. If not, you can correct me here, but after college, you spent some time uh, at Microsoft this you is during college during, during college okay so during yeah. college you spent some time at microsoft you had an internship at microsoft what lessons did you learn from your time at microsoft i and actually why do you say during it i had an internship during my college and i found the last year of college the hardest to be because i had a taste of what life was like after college and my interest in college became non-existent interesting interesting yeah so like basically how my degree were it was the same as you then so uh, my third year was internship and my fourth year was yeah. fauna a fauna year college and uh, the thing the biggest things i learned in microsoft was there's a high degree of like corporate rigor so there are corporate executives who are just absolute animals and i i didn't like that old phrase there is levels to this shit i didn't understand that phrase until i went in there and understood like there are people who just demolish everything and they're amazing um I understood that there's there can be a lot of red tape the bigger an organization gets and there is a bit of a trade-off between you can have a good brand name on your cv but you might not be as able to be as agile and to do as many things because there's a lot of like um sort of tape around you but like i learned how to work in teams and expectations of managers and even just to understand how a corporate organization works and thinks like that was really really helpful to me and it goes without saying the people there were so nice as well. Like they were just like, they easily, like we got paid well in that place yeah. compared to other companies, you know, they have every right to not, or to get it for free because we have yeah. to go brand name under our name. So that's sort of what I learned from that. Um, but I actually went into final year with like a way more mature head on my shoulders. I think I went into it as like the guy who makes YouTube videos and thinks he's the shit. And I was definitely humbled by, all the good work that they do there, you know? And, uh, but I actually found following you so much easier after thing. Right. Cause, cause I already knew what it was like to work for myself. Cause I was doing that since I was 18, but, uh, I understood how to get through like just shit work. Um, because you're dealt a lot of it when you start off in any organization. And that was the same with final year. And like, I did so well compared, like I was so shit at academics first and second year. I just didn't really do it at all like i hated it but then uh, i got a 2-1 in final year so um i did so much better in my last year interesting how it uh, has a different impact on on people going complete left field then phone watch my assumption is that you went door to door correct and door to door, that? yeah yeah that's something that very few people have the balls to even do i've done it myself and 
it, it teaches you a lot of lessons. What did you learn from that? I think one of the main things I learned was that you got to persevere is one thing. And that often having like a quote unquote shit job is not necessarily a bad thing. So when I was doing the phone watch job, I used to like leave the house. So to put it in context, I was in DCU doing genetics. I hated it. I left. I had no job. I had never had a job before. And uh, I just saw this thing with phone watch applied and just went for it because it, I, it was just an interview and they were hiring a lot of people. And um, when I went in, I realized that it was like all commission based and it was going to be a bit of a tough slog. Um, but like, I'm naturally quite stubborn anyway. So even though when I was coming home, mom and dad were like, why would you, why would you go do that? Because it's not as if I needed to, cause I could just live off mom and dad if I wanted to, yeah. not that we have a lot of money, but like we're, you know, I could sit at home here all day and like, there wouldn't be any problems. Um, but I just decided to do it. And what I learned from it was like how to deal with fear and how to deal with like uh, people who are very disagreeable and how to deal with like rejection. And um, I remember like the very first time I got a sale, it was like the scariest experience ever because it was like 10 PM West side of Dublin, go into the house. And I was like, I was amazed I got in because we had practiced it so much like in the office, but it's a different ball game in the office versus out in the field. And when I actually got into the house, I remember that I had no idea how to sign the contract. I, like my mind completely went blank. And like, all you need is three signatures. And if you don't walk away with those three signatures, the likelihood that they'll allow you back in to sign them is like minuscule. So uh, I was like sweating buckets, ringing my manager, running to the bathroom and um, trying to get the, like, I think I had to get another contract sent out to me. And that by midnight I had the thing signed and I was like shit in a brick, but I went home so happy. And uh, with, with door to door sales, you really learn about winning and losing because like it's zero or one, like you walk away with no contract signed or a contract signed. And uh, I eventually left that five or six months in. I never made more than like probably 1500 in a month, but uh, I learned a huge amount and like it hardened me up a lot. And uh, I'm really grateful for it. Yeah, it's interesting to use the word rejection because I had similar experiences. I now still work in sales. I sold a business so I could get back into sales. Crazy, you might think. But my, my attitude shifted when I had this experience. There was these two guys that came around. They were part of a religious organization trying to convert me to their side, as you may think. But they come around six months on the dot every six months. And my answer was always the same. No, thanks. See you later. But they'd go, uh, they, they'd leave with a smile and they'd go to the next door and they were always rejected. And one day I ran out after them, probably crazy, but I said to them, how have you just faced 12 no's and you're still smiling? I'd have thrown in the white tail and they just said, uh, they're not ready. And I was like, who's not ready? The people that we're talking to, they're just not ready. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. And when you shift your attitude to just, they're not ready, you don't have to say it out of my head. And also someone else told me, you know, every no is closer to a yes. I found that harder to get over the fact that they're not ready helped me massively. I want to move on to lead generation. I'm a big, big preacher in that intent matters. So I'll tee this up for you in a sense that a lot of virtual events over the last 18 months, particularly I work in the SaaS space, have gone in with uh, the hope of putting on an event to generate leads. I think that's the wrong strategy. I think that if your goal in, in running an event is to deliver the best experience possible, the leads will come as a result. So I think the intent is to deliver an exceptional experience rather than the intent to generate leads. Um, I'd love to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, like I think uh, that really comes across in people's social media content. Like I speak to a lot of business people and some of them go, I'm going to really get out there and start pumping stuff out on LinkedIn and YouTube and all those things. But uh, my opinion on say social media content is that it should be coming from like the right place. Like you should be making it because you want to make it and you actually have a, a point that will help somebody else. Not necessarily that they're going to ring you up and like take you for a video job or hire your business or all that stuff. And ironically, when you actually do it from, as you said, a place of like good heart, the people who end up coming to you, they invariably like never ask about the price or they never like they, uh, they trust you already because you 
you were vulnerable enough to like speak your mind and they they think you'll actually listen to them so um people can tell a million miles away when people are being fake so mm-hmm. like you just sort of got to be yourself no there's definitely a place for outbound sales like there's definitely a place for sending out emails to really? email lists with sales assets and booking people on calls that's definitely for certain and there's there's a time and a place to ask for things but there's also a time and a place to give as well and um that means uh what's the thing i would learn in primary school to forgive and not to count the cost basically to to give without asking of anything in return i think that's what you're getting at there give without expectation i think that's what gary vaynerchuk says in some of his videos i I do want to get into outbound but before i get into that one of the notes here i have is you know times are changing but many still work the old way the old way being phone calls i do it myself it's effective um and even trade shows i was listening to a uh podcast yesterday and a well-known person in my industry said that he'll still continue to go to trade shows, although they're virtual, because, and he knows they're not effective, but it will be noted if he's not there. My mind blew. I was just like, like you're just spending thousands on these, but the reason you won't give up is because it will be noted if you're not there. I disagreed with him. Um, One of the arguments he made is that digital can be easily distracting. I agreed. Depends how and where you spend your time. What would you say to him and all those others that are not bought into the digital space and the what we spoke about, intent matters and the value of building a brand over time? Yeah, like I think any new technology, anything new is always like annoying. So like yeah. Clubhouse just came out and I was like, fuck this. I run a, ran a TikTok house. I just want to do the TikTok thing. I know TikTok, it's like, fuck these new people. And uh, then like, I watch a couple of Gary Vee videos and then my friends would tell me about Clubhouse and I end up on Clubhouse and then I start using it a bit and I go, ah, I understand why this could be a cool thing, you know? And I think obviously it's a lot easier to just stick with things, you know? And yeah. like, I look, I do that as well. We all do that. But um, sometimes if you're able to think of things critically, you have to ask yourself, am I getting better bang for my book doing this versus that? There's always like a choice. Like, do I do this or do that? Do I, do I put out a LinkedIn video? Do I do direct mail? Do I do a TV ad? Do I do an Instagram ad? And although things may have worked for you, for you before, like innovation and all that is down to like trying out new things. And sometimes it just means being open-minded to listen to someone like yourself, Rian, or someone who's had experience in more of the digital space. And just like ask the question, like, did it help? Did it help going on digital? Maybe some places it, it actually works to do direct mail. Like I think for Domino's, direct mail still works for me because it's like, I actually, even though I hate junk mail, when they, that comes in my door, I'm like, oh, I might get a Domino's tonight. And there, yeah. there is a time and a place for everything. Like maybe it is worth spending 20K on Irish Times articles back and front if you're going for that older demographic, like Mm -hmm. my dad who has a digital subscription. So there's no blanket rule for everybody, but it's a bit like, uh, uh, maybe it's a bad example, but like in college, they try and give you a taste of all the aspects of business and then you choose which one you want to go into. And like that comes from a place of, if you don't know what your palate is for business you don't know what you're going to like and if you're to funnel yourself into one thing before you've tasted everything else then you may end up doing something you don't like doing and it's similar with digital marketing it's like if i'm not trying out a bunch of different things like direct mail like email like newsletters like videos like photos equally for me i'd argue well why am i doing so much video why can't i do more written word maybe written word to do better it's important to have a taste of everything and uh to sort of pick out what you think will work for your business. And if your target audience is spending time there, it'd be crazy not to test. Exactly. Yeah. And most of the time these things are free, unlike a trade show, which costs, it could cost a lot of money. Whereas like LinkedIn yeah. is free pretty much. So yeah, other than time, but yes. Um, yeah. The goat house or the go house, man, I say, I think I can't call it, I watch the video, you can't call it the goat house anymore. Uh, I think <laughs> I, I, I think I know why I haven't Googled the goat house. I want to talk about outbound and I'm leveraging the go house because it's your most recent venture. 
I'm curious to know your top three sources of lead generation. How do you attract the attention of brands so that you can have money coming in? Because from watching one or two of your videos, it's not a cheap thing to run. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, well, depends how you define cheap and expensive, you know, like uh, for us, I don't think it's relatively expensive for Ireland, but like if you're to place it in different countries or if you're to run the model that we're going to run with this year, it becomes a lot more like profitable and makes a lot more sense. But um, in terms of like lead gen, basically the first couple months we didn't really do any because it was like very new. We wanted to see if this thing worked. Um, we were figuring out a lot of things and like we didn't focus too much on sales because it was about just getting something started basically. And it was in December that we really started, like November, December, started to ramp stuff up, which was, you know, email lists, assets that we created, cool videos, booking people for calls. And once we booked them on calls, it was a case of like, well, how do you want to work with us? You know, there was loads of different ways you could. There was like sponsored campaigns. There was individuals pages. There was white label content. There was like lots of stuff like that. And that's pretty simply the, the approach we took for our like lead gen okay uh was there anything that you tried and tested that didn't work out um when it came to lead gen yeah yeah good question i think like we tried a few different emails to see which converted better that was one one thing as well we found is like you sort of just want to reach out to a pretty wide group of people and see who comes back because you can't really know exactly who's going to come back to you all the time we had like rough parameters of who we wanted to reach in terms of like industry country and all that kind of stuff um but it's it's not always the usual suspects who come back you, you know yeah. you could just hit people at the right time so um i think that was probably the biggest thing i, le I learned anyway Okay, so your objective, if I'm understanding correctly, was to get people on the phone or a call, Zoom call. Then from there, you could take it. And uh, what I hear is one of the ways you did that was via email. Any other ways, Instagram, DM, pick up the phone, call on them, go, well, you probably couldn't go to their premises because it was COVID, that was happening. Mm -hmm. But what are the top three ways you get them onto that call? Yeah, to be honest, man, it was mainly just email. Yeah, we did a little bit of DMing, but... um there's probably a lot more we could have explored. Like I have a friend who does a lot of Instagram DMs to book clients or to get clients. Um, yeah, it was actually mainly just email. So I definitely think we could get better and do more of those things. Nice. Well, look, I tip hat to you because going out and you're doing your own business is not easy. Uh, but but doing what you've done can, adds an extra layer to that. I, I compared it to, and you'll understand when I finish the comparison, to Dana White running the UFC. He's got a shit ton of people who have large followings and have big egos. You are running a house with people who, whether they want to hear it or not, they love attention and they've got followings. How do you manage that? Is that easy? Is it difficult? Is there problems all the time? Yeah, like I think people can't get to the social media positions they're in without having like a degree of personality, you know what I mean? And that's so good. Like that's in a way that what makes them who they are. But like what I learned anyway by living in the house is that everybody has their own highs and lows. Like so the way you see someone on camera is not the way they are in real life. They're yeah, two very different people. Yeah. And like, yeah, th there was definitely points where like personalities clashed and there was definitely points where it was hard to get the group to gel together sometimes. And like maybe individuals, they definitely had their own individual like wants and needs. Um, but like, I guess I sort of accept that as just part of the, the process. You know what I mean? Like you can't have yin without the yang. Sometimes you need these personalities to seem a bit crazy because then on the other side of it, you see that they're like very talented at what they do. And nobody in the house is crazy by any means, but um you understand people's unique quirks of being a creative, if that makes sense. Like I'm sure Dan and White has to deal with loads of stuff with Conor McGregor, but like yeah. he turns up and he gets pay-per-views and that's all that matters. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Accountability is um, a blind spot people often bump into. Um, so as a founder of a business, how do you evaluate whether your performance has met your expectations? Do you have someone, I know you mentioned a business partner, do you have someone that you talk to? Do you have a coach that you go to? Do you have monthly review meetings? Yeah, uh, I think accountability is probably something we could get better at. Like, 
obviously there's me and my co-founder Jake and we'd hold ourselves accountable but I was even mentioning him to him during the week that it would be good to have an external body to show results to once a month or something and just go hey what do you think of that because often like an external voice can give you a more objective answer about things uh, but in terms of the the company because we still have like employees who work with us to to build stuff for the future we'd have stuff like weekly check-ins we'd we wouldn't have like monthly reports but we would have like regular meetings where we check someone's work and if it's not up to scratch we just roast them on it and they should roast me in it as well because like you got to set really high standards to build anything of anything worth anything not even a big business to get like even a small level of success you need very very high standards higher than you'd you'd think you'd need so it's definitely my and jake's role to sort of set those standards and to constantly reevaluate them through the lens of talking to other people as well because it's only when you it's a bit like when i went to microsoft and saw the sickos in the boardrooms who do crazy good work i don't understand that until i see it in action so it's sort of my role as well to like meet with people and see how they conduct themselves and then sometimes ask myself oh jesus maybe i'm not at the level i should be at so nice nice well talking about going to whether you want to call it independent boards or other people hiring is also something that i want to bring up because you've hired people is that off good feel is that off looking through their showreel on online to see the work they produced is that leveraging an outsider board to get them to help like say here's what i'm looking for go find me that and bring me 10 people and i'll interview them how do you do that yeah it's a bit of a dark art hiring uh probably something that's like the most underrated i think as ceo because like it's so core to your business because the people who you hire like really set the culture in a, in a big way so for us it, like to date we've only hired a max of like 10 there's not everybody is with us who started but there's we've hired about 10 people so far and half of it was sussing out through friends who they knew would like be a good fit and then the other half of it was people who we just had like conversations with and then after the conversation I'd go holy shit Jake he or she is really smart let's let's get her on board or like is there a role that they could fill because uh, we love people who just like lay the smack down. Like you give them a task and they go, this is how it should be done. You should do it like this, this, this. And uh, as someone who runs the business, like I pretty much just want my staff to go here. I, I, might, I need to give them direction, obviously, but then they go off and they just crush it like in a certain area. And then they come back and they're like, this is what I did. As opposed to needing to wean off me all the time for answers and they need to have like a high degree of autonomy, if that makes sense. So yeah, completely. And one of the things I noticed, I, I did a deep dive on research before this podcast. You brought one of, I think it was a videographer or photographer into a room who you felt wasn't happy. Uh, and you questioned that to help him to push him towards an area that he could, you know, showcase the talents you knew he had. That's a skill in itself some people would just say he's not performing get rid of him why did you decide to go down the route of let's bring him in and see what's wrong yeah like i think sometimes there are scenarios where people come in and then their roles change and like maybe the role isn't there for them anymore which is like very it's like quite sad in a way because like they came in with a specific person's purpose and then as the business like evolves and changes it wasn't what it once was and like all of a sudden that person can't like fulfill that role in that scenario where in, and in that particular one it wasn't that the business had completely changed it's just the scenario had changed and the stuff that that person was doing it needed to change like and we just decided in that moment that instead of doing these two things he was going to double down on this one thing which we felt like he was really good at and there is a mix there between you want to give people stuff that you need done, obviously like stuff to do in the business, but you also want to give them stuff that like they're really good at because you want to give them stuff they're good at and that they like and that you need. And then when all yeah. those three things come together, you end up getting a very good performer. You can get like a talented person and you put them in a role, but if they're not happy with it, then it's not worth it. And it's also not worth it having like a happy, talented person doing something that you don't need because that also can't work. 
So you sort of need like all three things to come together. And I'm very new to hiring. Like prior to September, I only had ever hired like one or two people. So uh, I'm very much learning as I go with this. Um, but, and like, I don't know how right or wrong this is, but I, don't, I try and do come from, like I'm from North County, Dublin, raised on a farm. I try and do come from a place of like uh, empathy and like fairness and giving people their best chance to succeed and like getting work done, but also being fair. You know what I mean? Like I do yeah. try my best to be kind. And I think that goes a long way as well with people. Look, appreciate your time today. Without giving away too much of what you don't want to give away, what's the future of 2021 for Thomas Arnold? And is it Jake you said your partner was called? Jake, yeah. Jake, yeah. you're not my... Uh, like my partner, your boyfriend, but your business yeah, partner, gotcha. He has a he has a fiance, and um, yeah, like I guess we're keeping plans pretty. Uh, like the plans aren't secret or anything. Like we plan on doing the house in other places. That's it. And we're trying to figure out how to fucking do that. Um, obviously a bit constrained with the pandemic, but we're still going to do it. Might take a little bit longer than expected, and um, I'm excited to like. I think. Like some people, I don't know who these people are, like, because nobody said it to me, but some people probably thought, oh, the house is over, the guys failed, that was fun, but they're ultimately fucking failures. But like, that's just never who I, like, I'm very much a do something, oh, that was epic, take a rest, let's do it again. And in this case, I want to take what we did and really 10 exit. And that's what I'm really excited about this year. So, uh, we're in a we're in like a bit of a hibernation phase at the moment where like nobody knows what's going on but um it'll come out and it'll be it'll be good and i'm really excited for the world to see it awesome to hear wouldn't bother paying attention to those that shit on it because you're your worst case scenario you try something but you learn a shit ton from it so you can go into a new venture and try again they're they're probably just jealous that they don't have the balls to do it themselves it's great to see the social media stars and social media start to get some recognition from the likes of like him i hate him the the paul brothers fighting these boxers like it's 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 dope to see like it it, it really is because times are changing um, and i do wish you best of success wherever the hell the go or the sorry the, yeah the go house takes you in the future man thanks so much Rina. i appreciate it <laughs> no worries <laughs>